All right, I want to do a quick video here on the question of I'm saved, now what? Uh, that's something that we get a lot here. Uh, a lot of people, they, they get saved, they come to the Lord either through our salvation video or some other way, and they come here to YouTube and they type in something about the Bible or whatever, and they'll find this channel. Okay, and uh, there aren't too many Bible-believing channels on YouTube. Okay, there are in comparison to all the other ones I'm saying. So, let's start out here by just asking you the question, okay? Have you truly believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, come to Him as a sinner, believed by faith, uh, and prayed to the Lord asking Him to save you. Romans chapter 10 verse 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Have you done that? You say, yes, I have, okay? Then you're saved now this video is going to tell you what you need to do next. Okay, the first thing that you need to do is what you've already done. Say, so what do you mean get saved? Well, yeah, that's, in, that's how it starts. But calling upon the name of the Lord. Okay, it's called prayer. The first thing that you need to develop as a new Christian is your prayer life. All right, talking directly to God. Because now He is your Heavenly Father. You have that ability now. If you are dead in trespasses and sins, a lost person, then you can't pray to the Lord. The Lord doesn't hear the prayers of the lost. Okay, The only prayer He hears from them will be a prayer of coming to Him for salvation. Okay, Them praying for you know, sick relatives or whatever else, God doesn't listen. Okay, um, But now that you are saved, you need to develop that prayer life where you talk to the Lord about things that are going on. Let's look here in Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. Here's the instructions Jesus is giving on the subject of prayer. It says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Uh, real quick, let me break in here and just say, you should avoid these national prayer days and prayer breakfasts and things, you know, where the, the lost world is meeting together with professing Christians to pray for the nation or something like that. I'd avoid them things like the plague. Okay, those aren't of the Lord. All right, why? Well, they're standing in the corners in the, in the, in the streets and they're praying to be seen of men. Oh, God, help our nation, whatever. You know, why don't you get saved? Why don't you call for... Uh, you know, rebuke sin and things like that. Well, they won't do that. You know, they want God to help the nation without repenting of sin. It doesn't work. But to look at verse 6 here, Matthew chapter 6, verse 6. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut, when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. Okay, avoid these ridiculous little prayers. I've heard people do it. You know, they'll sit down to eat and they say, um, God is great, God is good, and we thank him for our food. Give us this day our daily bread. And I can never remember the rest of it. Something like help us with our weary head or something. I don't know. But the point is, it's just vain. They just repeat it over and over and over again. God doesn't want to hear that. All right? I mean, how would it be if I came to you and I said, Hi, how are you? Hope you're good. Nice to see you. Every time I talk to you, you wouldn't think of me of much, you know, you wouldn't think that I was much of a friend to you. You know, well, the Lord's the same way. The Lord wants to hear from you. He wants to know what's going on in your life. He wants to hear what your requests are. John chapter 15 verse 16 says, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. Okay, the next point when it comes to prayer is that when you pray, you ask God the Father in the name of Jesus Christ. Okay? You start out your prayer, dear Heavenly Father, or dear God, or whatever. You pray to the Father, and at the end you say, 
I ask this in the name of thy son Jesus or in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ or in Jesus name start out pray to God in the name of Jesus okay that's the way the thing works because 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 5 says for there is one God and one mediator between God and men the man Christ Jesus okay Jesus Christ is the mediator between God the Father and man that's very important to remember okay that's the way the Lord set it up it's not me it's not church tradition or whatever else it's scripture pray to God the Father in the name of Jesus Christ that's how the thing works okay very very important for you to talk to the Lord next the next thing that you need to do as a new Christian and these aren't you know a year separated or something these are you need to do them all right in succession first learn how to pray okay secondly is Bible reading okay you need to purchase a good King James Bible now I have a couple videos on that uh, some good ones I'm a big proponent if you've seen my videos you know that I am a big proponent of local church Bible publishers okay they make the best ones out there in my opinion um, they do a really really nice job real high quality this is my old Cambridge Bible and uh, this is the one I use all the time because it's my one I kind of had all these years but you can see there it's got duct tape in the in the inside I mean it's falling apart um, and I know some some of the brethren have said I could send it back to them and they'd rebind it and all that but eh. <laughs> I use it every day you know I, I don't really want to be parted from it but local church Bible publishers best prices best quality uh, they have the right text and everything I mean it's it's you don't have to worry about it you can feel safe buying a local church Bible publishers Bible and I'm not making anything on it so don't get excited don't think that I'm you know secretly getting kickbacks from local church Bible publishers I'm not okay um, study Bibles there are some that I think are okay this is uh, my common man's reference Bible this is a lambskin one uh, this is a real nice Bible I'm going to be doing a review coming up on some of the notes because some of the notes that he has in here are controversial, you know, and some people get all excited, you know, oh, you recommend it, and it has these weird notes in it. I'm going to talk about that in an upcoming video. Uh, it's in the works. I, I don't know when that's going to come out, but uh, here we have the Ruckman Reference Bible. This is the first edition. Uh, another good one. Um, if you want a Bible with commentary, I generally steer clear of commentary uh, right in with the text of the Bible. I'll talk more about that later. But get a good King James Bible. Don't get an NIV. Don't get an English Standard Version or New American Standard or whatever. New King James. You don't want anything but a King James Bible. Okay. Um, you say, well, it's the hardest to read. No, it isn't. Uh, there are there have been studies where they found that it's about a fifth to sixth grade reading level about 5.8 is what it is um, it's not the hardest to read I mean think about it there have been people for the last 400 plus years now you know actually 402 years now um, people uneducated hillbillies and things like that you know that have read it and understood it just fine uh, some of the greatest evangelists ever had a high school education so don't believe this this propaganda that it's you know too difficult to understand but there's another thing there which i'm going to talk about here in just a minute but john chapter 14 verse 23 i'm going to show you here something that's very important jesus answered and said unto him if a man love me he will keep my words and my father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him god's word should be the most important thing in your life okay prayer is that constant connection and the Bible does say that you're to pray without ceasing okay that doesn't mean you have to drive down the road keep with your eyes closed you know you can't you know you can pray and you can talk to the Lord and, and again you'll grow at that you'll get better at that talking with the Lord but you need to pray according to Scripture okay what do I mean by that well don't ask for things that don't appear in this book if I said I want a solid gold spaceship that I could fly to the planet Mars and back and pray for it till I get it, well, 
come on. Read the Bible. That's not something that a Christian is supposed to be asking for. See, you pray according to Scripture. All right, I can pray for good health. I can pray that other brothers and sisters in Christ will be healed of sicknesses that they have or, or whatever. I can pray for another reason, which I'm going to be covering here very soon. But um, pray, if you know your Bible, you'll pray accordingly. Okay? Another thing about this book being very precious is another verse that proves it is Job chapter 23 verse 12 it says here neither have I gone back from the commandment of my of his lips I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food okay another very important thing that you need to do is when you get up in the morning this comes first okay and you say well I gotta get up I gotta get to work okay then get up earlier Go to bed earlier, get up earlier. Read your Bible first. Don't say I'm going to go and feed myself, you know, and make breakfast or something like that and then forsake the Bible because you took too long eating your breakfast. This book needs to take priority. You say, well, what happens if I don't? What happens if I don't make the Bible my main priority? Well, then you're going to start having problems. And that's why you see Christians falling apart or falling away or, you know, the hypocrites that people get all excited about that's usually the reason why but uh, the question comes up which I kind of addressed a little bit there what if I can't understand the Bible and I'm going to tell you right now when you first start to read this book it's going to seem strange to you okay I was raised in churches and I had an NIV for 15 years and I started reading the King James Bible and it was like huh you know at first but what was the problem? Well, I was just, you know, just getting back with the Lord and, and I had a lot of sin problems that I needed to get rid of. And what I started to do, which is what you need to do if you can't understand this book and you're saved, is I started to pray to the Lord and ask for wisdom. Let me give you some scripture for that. James chapter 1 verses 5 through 6 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Okay, you need to approach this book in a certain way. You ask God, you pray, so you use that first part there, you use prayer and say, God, I want to understand your word. Please help me to understand it. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Ask God for wisdom when it comes to this book. But the second thing that you need to do is you need to approach this book with a believing spirit. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, he received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. If you come to this Bible doubting it and saying it's just a translation or the Hebrew and the Greek is better and you know blah, 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 all the lines of the Alexandrian cult. If you come with a doubtful mind towards this book and say there's probably contradictions in it, it's probably not written right, God's not going to reveal anything to you. Okay, and to illustrate that point, I want to tell you a little story. I want to tell you a story called A Tale of Two Fields. Now, imagine, if you will, that there are two different fields. Now, I tell you that the first field used to be the site of a bank back in the early 1800s. And this bank was destroyed in a flood, and all of the coins in the bank went into the mud in this field and they're still buried there. And that field is filled with gold and silver coins. And you're allowed to go dig in it. I hand you your shovel, what are you going to do? You're going to run into that field and just start digging anywhere. Right? Why? Because you know that you're going to find some gold and silver coins. See? Okay, remember that one. Now there's a second field. And I say, now this other field over here, this one was used for farming. Okay? For all, all the time I've ever known, they just farmed crops in that thing. Now you might 
find a gold or silver coin or maybe a copper coin or a dime or something like that or a penny, you might find a coin in there. Maybe. I don't know. Here's your shovel. Well, are you going to be real anxious to go dig in that field? Probably not. Probably going to say, you know, I don't think that's worth my time. Maybe if you have a metal detector or something, but not to just go dig in it, you know. Well, what made the difference there? Well, you see, the first field, you knew that there's gold and silver coins in it. So you approached it believing that you were going to find hidden treasure. The second field, you were told that there's nothing in it. So you approached that field with an unbelieving spirit, saying, I'm, why would I even bother digging in this thing? I'm not going to find anything. See, two totally different reactions there. Now let me just give you some scripture here to tie this thing together. Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 through 6 says, My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding, yea, if thou criest after knowledge and lift, liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then thou shalt understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom out of his mouth, cometh knowledge and understanding. Hmm. So in other words, if you come to this book believing that you are reading God's perfect word, the Lord is going to show you treasures, hidden treasures in this book. And I can tell you something, there are some amazing things in this book. And there are going to be times you'll read through a, a passage of Scripture and you come back a month later or a year later and you read through that same passage and the Lord just says, look at that. And the Holy Spirit reveals something to you and you go, wow, this is amazing. And it'll line up with some event that you're going through in your life and just perfectly fit. Happens all the time. When you approach it with a believing spirit. When you come to this book expecting to find hidden treasure in it. Don't come to the King James Bible with a critical spirit. If you do, the Lord's not going to reveal a thing to you. So that's very important. The second thing, okay? First you have Bible reading, and that's something that you need to do every day. Just pick a chapter. A lot of new Christians start out with the book of John, and then they'll go to the book of Romans. After that, maybe go back to Genesis, start your way through the Bible. Okay? This book is about... A kingdom okay and a king by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and there's a whole lot more I could say there in that subject but I, I can't forsake a time here but you start to read this book okay that needs to be a top priority prayer Bible reading next comes Bible study okay first Timothy chapter 4 verse 13 says till I come give attendance to reading to exhortation to doctrine now, Paul told Timothy, Timothy was a young preacher, he said, you need to give attendance to reading. Now, there are, this is the book that you've got to read the most, but there are also many other good study materials that will help you grow as a Christian. And I want to cover a couple of those today. And you say, well, but how do I know what the source of truth is? You know, what if, what if I read a book and, it's, and it has errors in it, you know, and, because man-made books do have errors. What if, how do I know which books to buy and which things should I avoid and which things should I get? Well, 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So your job as a Christian, as you grow older, as you mature, you're going to have to read things. I've read books, and I thought, wow, that's really profound. And a couple years later, I'll read something else, I study something else, and I think back to the book that I read previously, and I think, boy, that was heretical. <laughs> That's just the way it's going to be. You're going to have to study. Study takes time. All right? You can't expect to be a master, mature Christian your first year. Okay? It's not going to happen. It's going to take you years of study, years of research. All right? And you're going to have to learn to rightly divide the word of truth. That applies to your King James Bible. You have to approach it dispensationally. Again, another big study. 
but you have to approach this book and rightly divide it. Obviously, in the Old Testament, you're going to read that there are animal sacrifices going on. We don't do that anymore. You didn't have to sacrifice a, a lamb a, without blemish to pay for your sins. You didn't have to go someplace to the tabernacle and give an animal to a Jewish rabbi and have him sacrifice it on the altar. You know, you didn't have to do that. Why? Something changed from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Watch out for people that try to tell you that there's no dispensational differences in the Bible. They're false prophets. Major false prophets. Another issue. But I want to talk for a second here about uh, study aids. Okay, first of all, a good thing to have is a concordance, like this one, Strong's Concordance. Now, these are really good for doing word studies. There's a thing in your King James Bible, uh, the law of first mention. Oftentimes a word will be defined with the first time that it appears in the text, okay, the first time it appears in the Bible. So you can look this, you can look at this and you can see how many times does the word truth appear? How many times does the word whatever? Jesus or God or you know Lord or whatever like that these are good what you need to avoid though is the in the back the Hebrew and Greek definitions all right you don't speak Hebrew you don't speak Greek so don't worry about those languages okay you see the problem here with the Hebrew and the Greek is that Dr. Strong was a member of the American Standard Version Committee he was not a King James Bible believer. So what he'll do a lot of times is he'll say, well, yeah, here's the word in the King James Bible up here in the concordance. And then you turn back here, you read the little number beside it, and it says go back here so you can find out what the original word meant. And you go back there, and the word is actually the same word that the Alexandrian Bibles use. It's deceptive. Okay, doesn't mean you should just totally write off the strongest concordance, or, or I think there's the Young's and... Uh, what is it, the Crudens or something like that. There's a couple of them. Concordances for your King James Bible. Doesn't mean you just scrap them. They're still okay to use. Okay, there's also, you can uh, get a computer program, Sword Searcher. I use that a lot. It's also very good. But I like to have a book, too, a, a paper version of it. So, concordance is a good idea. Another thing that you might want to pick up is this thing. Webster's 1828 Dictionary. This will have more um, Bible appropriate um, definitions for your words. In fact, you'll even have scripture references in here. He'll give you a word, define it, and then he'll show where in, in your King James Bible, where does it show up. So this is probably one of the best ones out there for defining some of those words that are hard to understand in your King James Bible. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to tell you, oh, the King James Bible is just simple to understand. You can understand the whole thing the first time you read it. Uh-uh. Uh, you know, it's been well said that if the King James Bible was easy to understand, then it would have been written by somebody who had less sense than me. You know, I wouldn't want that. You know, the God of the universe wrote this book. It should be a little bit above the average street level. Okay. You don't want it to be dumbed down. Not at all. Commentaries. Again, I showed these two commentary Bibles over here. I don't generally like them within a Bible. But up there, you can kind of see right up in here, these over here, these are uh, Dr. Ruckman's commentaries. Um, you can read through those. He's not going to correct the text. Uh, some people don't like his harsh style whatever. If you want the truth, you'll, you won't you will care about his quote-unquote harsh attitude and whatever else. Um, he knows the book. Okay, and he isn't going to correct the Bible either. He won't correct the King James Bible. So you can read it without fear of, you know, having to worry about that. Um, but there are other commentaries out there. I'm sure uh, there's some that, that uh, again, you know, they need to be based on the King James Bible. If, they, if you're reading a commentary and a guy says, Actually, the Greek word should be translated, or uh, the New American Standard has it better rendered, or something like that. You don't want that commentary. The commentaries can be a help, but again, you really just need to read the Bible and read it as it is. Let the Lord show you, okay? Because 
another little neat saying that you need to keep in mind is your King James Bible is the only book that has the author present every time you read it. Okay, The Lord will show you this book. This is a spiritual book. The Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. All right, Important to remember that. The other thing, the other study aid that you can use to help you as you grow as a Christian are general books on Christianity. Okay, One of the most helpful that I've found are books like these. Here you have Heroes of the Faith, men like William Tyndale. You can see there. Charles Spurgeon. J. Frank Norris. Billy Sunday. Sam Jones. And Peter Cartwright. Okay? Were these men perfect? No. They weren't perfect. Were they sinless? No. Were they doctrinally pure in everything that they believed and taught? No. But I'll tell you what, the Lord used those men, and you'll learn things from them, and you'll actually see a lot of times they had struggles just like what you're going through. An interesting scripture, uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 17 says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so as ye have us for an ensample. And like I said, You'll be surprised how much you have in common with Christians that have lived 100, 200 years ago, sometimes even farther back than that. Like William Tyndale was back in the 1500s, you know, the 16th, early 16th century. He was executed in the early 16th century. You know, he was a Bible translator, if you don't know. Okay? And a lot of his work went into the, you know, ended up in the King James Bible. He was a good man. But uh, that's another thing. And, of course, there's a lot of other books out there. Um, some of these books back here, you have books on uh, the Bible version issue. You can learn about manuscript evidence and some of the more advanced things. You learn about creation, science. You can learn about different music things, which I'm going to be getting next here. Um, a lot of different things that you can learn about. Study is the whole issue there. Give attendance to reading. If you want to mount to something for the Lord, you're going to have to learn to read. All right? God gave us a book in a written form. That's why He expects you to be a good reader, to be an avid reader. Okay, You can learn some things here on YouTube. Good. But you can't be all video-based or audio-based. You have to be a reader. All right? That's important to remember. How about godly music? Well, if you want all the technical details, you can listen to my study, uh, The Devil's Music, Parts 1 and 2, here on YouTube. It's also on Sermon Audio. Um, but Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19 says, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Okay? And again, I talked about all the technical details there in my study. But the fact of the matter is that you should avoid any type of music whose primary emphasis is on rhythm. You know, because rhythm is the one that lines up with the flesh. And again, like I said in my study on music, if you want to prove that scientifically, turn on some music that has a real heavy driving beat and watch people's bodies move. The easiest way to, to demonstrate that is take a little baby and put on some music that has a real heavy boom, 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 like that. And you'll see that little baby starting to, starting to move. Why? Because they're fleshly. Okay, they have not de developed their soul and their spirit yet. They, they're not spiritual. Okay, a baby is just fleshly. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 and 17. Here's why you need to avoid fleshly music. This I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. You want to amount to anything as a Christian, you're going to have to put down the flesh. Okay, Feed the spirit with spiritual things. Okay, and I just want to show you, I don't have too many, very many CDs here right now. I just kind of put this video together, um, and I... You know, I don't have them with me. But here's a good example 
of a godly form of music, Seminole String Band. They're, they have a channel here on YouTube. You can hear some of their music. Uh, very highly recommended. They are uh, Brother McNorton and his family. They are King James Bible believing. You don't again. You don't have to worry about lyrical content or anything else. You know, oh man, we can't let that song play while our children are in the room or something. Nope. You can listen to the whole thing without being offended. It's a good, very good music, good band. Um, there are other old hymns, um, traditional type of hymns, uh, the Old Rugged Cross, Amazing Grace, you know, Onward Christian Soldiers, uh, Nothing But the Blood, songs like that. Those are the ones that you need to look for. There are some good ones out there. Okay, um, that's very important as well. So you have prayer. You have Bible reading, Bible study, studying other topics, godly music, get rid of the fleshly, worldly music. If your music is on the top 10 charts or something like that, it's no good. The music of this world is very sinful, very fleshly, very wicked. Uh, just really bad. The next one. What do you need to do next as a new Christian? Witnessing. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 20 says, All things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Now that you are saved, now that you are a Christian, a child of the God of heaven, you are supposed to be an ambassador for him and go and preach Jesus Christ to the lost. You're going to have to talk to your lost relatives, to your lost co-workers, to your lost friends about Jesus Christ. You're going to have to have a changed life before them. Okay, the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's very important. All right? You have to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. And you're going to have to witness for Jesus Christ. And you say, oh boy, I, how on earth am I going to do that? I'm not, I, you know, I don't know the Bible that well yet. Well, I didn't say you had to get into a big, deep theological study and, and debate with somebody. You don't have to do that. All you have to do is just simply say, Jesus died for sinners. That's a very easy thing to say. But there are also other ways that you can witness. Okay, first of all, you can do some tracting. Now here's a couple examples of tracks. Here we have some chick tracks. These are good classical type of tracks. Here you have Fellowship Track League. Um, more and more I'm starting to use these, these ones here. Uh, Chick Tracks, I've always defended Chick Tracks, and I still do. I still think that these are some of the best out there. But there's some things that just doctrinally don't line up with the Bible. You know, winged angels and, and Satan down in hell, ruling from hell, you know. and Those things aren't true. Those things aren't scriptural. And you say, well, somebody could get saved as a result. Well, I don't think you should lie to get people saved. Um, I'm sorry. I just I, I have some problems with that, and uh, they, you know, they have some other things that I've seen. Chick tracks have been doing, and it's kind of distressing. These ones here, I, you know, here you have. Is something missing in your life? You know, that one you have. Um, it was said during the Roman Empire, all roads lead to Rome. Some say that about heaven today, all religious ro roads lead to heaven. Is that really true or is there just one way to heaven? The Romans road to heaven. Okay, another good one. Um, here we have, are you a Christian? Simple, basic. You know, it's just uh, some good wording. Not very big, just a little track like that. Real thin. You know, you can put that thing around. And let me just say about that real quick. Okay. You have co-workers or something, and, and you come in, you say, Hey, I just wanted to tell you I got saved. Here you can read about. Are you a Christian? There you go. Give them a tract. Send one to your lost relatives. 
you get a bill in the mail, you know, phone bill, electric bill, whatever other bills that you have, put one of these things in with it. Send in your bill. Hey, you never know who's, who's going to get it. You know, you get at these uh, things, and, you know, they have the business reply envelope with postage paid. Put a tract in it. Send it back. You know, there's a million different things that you can do. You go to the bank, you get that uh, the little envelope there that they put your cash in or whatever. You know, take that, take your cash out first, and then you put a tract in that thing, close it up, take it to a store someplace, set it down on a bench. Somebody's going to think that they're going to go and they're going to say, oh, there's something in that. They're going to think it's money. It's actually something more valuable than money. It's a gospel tract to tell you how to be saved. But there are a lot of ways. You can go to uh, restaurants, put these, you know, in the bathroom. You know, not on the toilet or something like that, but put them up above the sink or someplace where it's not going to look like it's been, you know, dirtied or whatever, you know, made filthy because it's near a toilet or something. You know, there are a lot of things that you can do with tracks. You can go to a store, you can put them in things there, you can lay them around at a store. In other words, you don't have to be really bold when you first get saved. Work your way up. All right, start out laying tracks around, then start to hand them to people. Then you will be able to start, once you get into it and you are a you become a better and better ambassador for Jesus Christ, you'll start to feel comfortable actually witnessing to people. That's the way the thing works. So you have tracked face to face. Talk to your relatives about the Lord Jesus Christ. You are an ambassador for Him now. Another way is the internet. Just go onto some video, uh, somebody's attacking the Lord or whatever. And witness, witness for Jesus Christ. Put a couple of verses of scripture on there or something. Every man shall give account of himself to God, you know, something like that. I mean, there are different ways that you can witness. And as time progresses, your boldness will also increase. All right, something else that's important. Okay, the next thing that, that you have to do, and the final thing that I'm going to talk about, well, not the final one, there's one other point, excuse me. But another very important thing is you should try to find a local body of believers to join. Okay? Um, this isn't always easy. I'll get back to that in a minute. But Hebrews chapter 10 verses 24 through 25 says, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Okay? One of the purposes of going to a church, finding a local body of believers, in other words, is to, to consider one another, to provoke one another to good works, you know, to encourage other Christians. As a new Christian, you're going to need some Christian friends. And it's a good idea to try and find some place locally. All right? Now, I know that there is a extreme dearth of good Bible-believing churches out there. And if you don't have any churches in your area that use the King James Bible and believe the King James Bible, don't go. Don't go to some modern church where the guy's preaching out of a new version. All right? I wouldn't waste time there. And you say, well, that's all that there is in, in my area. Well, then you're probably like a lot of other Bible believers out there. I've been in contact with hundreds of them, and they say there's nothing in our area. What are we supposed to do? Well, that's why I produced a video on starting a house church based on the King James Version. Now, you might not have that ability right away. Well, you won't have the ability to start a house church in time, perhaps. But the thing that you need to do, if you can't find, and if you really truly are going out and looking, and there's nothing in your area, and you can't move from that area or anything else, Again, I think, you know, you really should just stay there anyhow and do the work of the Lord there. What you should do then is you should find some good King James Bible-based preaching online and just devour it, okay? Listen to everything. All right, you know, some guys up there, a man, don't listen to women preaching, but, you know, if, if you can find some good King James Bible-believing preachers that really put out a lot of good information... Um, just 
take your time and listen to everything that they put out. Uh, I know some of the best on YouTube are um, uh, some of the ones I've found that are the best. There's probably some that I don't know of, but uh, Brother Mike Hoggard, uh, I think it's Prophetic Word at Ministries, I think. He's good. Uh, Brother Greg Miller, uh, he's also very good. I put, I've been putting a lot of my own stuff on the internet, and you know, I'm not trying to say I'm Mr. Perfect or great or anything, but you know, I have a lot of uh, Bible-based sermons that are on, that cover a lot of topics that you're going to run into in your life as a new Christian. So spend some time listening to good preaching. All right, find some good King James. Uh, preachers on the internet and listen to them. Even if you can find a good King James Bible believing church in your area, you would do well to spend most of your free time listening to preaching. Don't waste time here on YouTube watching a bunch of frivolous videos that won't mean anything in eternity and probably will pull you right back into the world. Spend your time listening to preaching. Get to know the Word of God. Study it on your own. Listen to good preaching. Very important. Finally, and this is the last point, Spiritual sacrifices, also known as sanctification. Okay, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God has a specific will for your life. Salvation is just the first part of it. Okay, After salvation, you need to pray. You need to read your Bible, study your Bible, study other subjects. You need to listen to the right kind of music. You need to witness to people. All right? You need to try to find a local body of believers to be part of. Go there, encourage one another, exhort one another. Get to know other Christians. And then you need to start figuring out what God's will is for your life. Okay, and the first part of that is you're not to conform to this world. And you're to perform spiritual sacrifices. Which means you need to start looking at the clothes that you wear and start asking the Lord, Lord, is this what you want me to wear? If it's worldly, if you're a woman and it's immodest, you know, if it's something that's going to make men lust after you, you need to get rid of it. And you need to start putting on the kind of clothes that the Lord would want a godly woman to wear. Alright? Um, if you're a man and you're wearing clothing that is dishonoring to the Lord and, and it might have profanity or be just not make you look like a Christian, well, you need to think about getting rid of that. What about your movies? What about your music? I'm going to tell you right now, I have burned hundreds of dollars worth of music CDs, movies, all sorts of things. Why? Sanctification. Sanctification is setting yourself apart from the world. Not being conformed to the world. If something is loved by the world, chances are it's hated by the, the Lord. Okay, the Bible talks about that. So, that process of sanctification, of separation from the world is how the Lord will reveal more things to you and He will do more for you and you will find out what His perfect will is for your life. Okay? Luke chapter 9, verse 23 through 26. And He said to them all, If any man will come after Me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow Me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for My sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. Now if you're saved right now in the church age that we live in before the rapture, if you're saved, I'm going to tell you right now, you cannot conform to this world. And you're going to have to, if you want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, you're going to have to learn to give up some things. But one thing that you don't ever have to worry about is losing your salvation. You cannot lose your salvation right now in the church age. All right? In the future, another dispensation, that's another story. But right now, 
you can't lose your salvation. So don't worry about that. And you say, oh, good, then I can sin like crazy. No, you can't. Because now you are a child of God and He will punish you like He would a child, a disobedient child. You don't want that. Okay? I've been through it. You don't want it. <laughs> Try to live for the Lord with the rest of your life. If you make a mistake, confess it, forsake it, move forward. That's a good formula to remember. But if you want to do anything for the Lord, you're going to have to deny what you, your goals in life are. Okay? And say, Lord, what do you want me to do with my life? Now that I'm saved, now that you saved me. See, you're not, you know, your life is not your own. You are bought with a price, the Bible talks about. So you don't have the freedom anymore to just say, I'll just do whatever I feel like doing. Well, you do, but then you get to heaven and you have no rewards. So if you want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, used mightily by the Lord, you're going to have to give up a lot of things. And you're going to have to start saying, Lord, what do you want me to do with my life? Not have a fancy car, not have a fancy house, not have all the money in the world and be famous. That's not, those aren't goals that the Lord wants for His children. What the Lord wants for His children is to see spiritual sacrifices that are well-pleasing to Him. Okay, you have to deny yourself. And see, if you have that approach to life as a Christian, when people make fun of you, when people mock you, it's not going to bother you. Because your rewards are in eternity and you're thinking, hey, this is great. I'm being persecuted for righteousness sake. People are making fun of me. Hey, this is wonderful. This is the way it's supposed to be. But if you aren't setting your sights on eternal things, if you aren't staying in the Word of God, if you aren't praying, if you aren't listening to the right kind of music, if you aren't witnessing, then what happens is you start to get that persecution, which will come, and you start to think, I better quit. I don't want to do this anymore. This isn't comfortable. Well, if you want to make it as a Christian, you're going to have to forget all that stuff. All right? That's the way it is. So that's going to be it. Get a good King James Bible. That's going to be very important. If you go to a store, don't let them talk you into anything else. Say King James Bible or nothing. Get a local church Bible publisher's Bible online. Watch my videos on that. You can see them up close and in detail and everything else. You know, but pray. Learn to pray to the Lord. Asking God the Father in the name of Jesus Christ. That's the way the thing works. Okay? Read your Bible. Study your Bible. Read other subjects. Listen to the right kind of music. Witness. Okay? Offer up spiritual sacrifices to the Lord. Those are the kinds of things that you need to do. Try to find a good church locally. All right? That's going to be the tough one, unfortunately. A hundred years ago, you could have gone to almost any church. They would have been reading the King James Bible, believing the King James Bible. Nowadays, good luck. I mean, I hate to say that, but it's, it's bad. It's real bad. So if you can't find one in your area, then just spend your time listening to good preaching. You'll find that you learn a lot more that way anyhow. You know, listen to good preaching regardless, like I said before, regardless if you can find a good church or not. You need to spend your time doing what the Lord wants you to do. Okay? And this is all if you want to be a successful Christian. If you want to be a failure as a Christian and mess up and fall back into the world and get messed up in sin and have a rough time of it and end up in heaven with very little, if any, rewards, then just don't do anything that I told you to do. Okay? Don't read your Bible. Don't pray. Don't witness to the lost. Don't find a good church locally. Don't listen to the right kind of music. Don't study the Bible. Don't read other things about the Bible. Just watch TV and, you know, do whatever you feel like doing. Then you end up in heaven with very little rewards. And you have a rough life down here. So that's the way it is. So that's going to be it for this video. Thank you very much for watching. And look for some more videos coming out in the future. That's it.